Woo. All right. Welcome to the Brains and Banter podcast. We are just so excited, over the moon, ecstatic to have Addie Berry on with us. Um, Addie's an intersex activist, uh, sex worker activist, uh, doing their PhD right now. Also has a black belt, like I could go on and on. Tattoo artist, <laughs> she created a comic. So we'll try and get into everything uh, because, yeah, just one of the most astounding, beautiful human beings I have ever encountered. So thank you for being here. Um, and I was thinking, do you want to just start um, by talking about how you got into so sort of like your personal story and how you got into activism and ev- everything that you're you're doing now. Sure. Thank you for having me. Um, so so good to be here and nice to meet everybody that I haven't met before. Yay. I guess I could start at the very beginning. Um, there was a drug pumped into pregnant women from the 1930s to the 1970s. Um, called diethyl sylvestrol, which is a synthetic estrogen. And um, it had, in the 1960s, they realized that the dairy workers and the farm workers, they were also pumping into animals, and they, they found that the farm workers were growing breasts and uh, becoming infertile. And you can't really have that. You can't have men going around with boobs so, or being infertile. So they stopped putting it into the animals and started using something else and continued to pump it into pregnant women for, for another decade. And uh, then all the issues started appearing like uh, multi-generational forms of cancer and things like that. But um, it's a lot of the stuff that comes about, out about DES gets uh, it's DES for short, it ends up getting kind of buried. Um, I'm still waiting for my payout payout from Big Pharma, but it hasn't really come yet. Um, Apparently, they're not interested. Try not to take offense. (laughs) Um, But I was uh, born intersex, um, I I believe, as a result of my mother taking this drug. And they've there's more and more paper uh, papers coming out now, or more recently, about the the effect. but basically attributing intersex um, variations to people on DES. But um, at the time, based on John Money's theories, the, the, the guidance for parents was to don't not to not tell anybody about your, your intersex baby, but um, move away, start your life over. And just that's, that's the thing to do. And on the other end, my mother had, I don't know how much you know about Ireland, but it's, it's, it, it's, I think the the trauma in Ireland is, uh, is, is not that it can't be rivaled, but it, it's, it's, it's tough. I mean, um, like in the 1930s, when England moved out of most of the country, out of the 26 counties at the bottom and Donegal, which is the top, but, uh, the, the Catholic church and the new government rolled back, um, women's rights drastically and they criminalized sex work and contraception and they turned there was a lot of poor houses which are basically all over the world um but in ireland in the 30s they turned into prisons and they started dragging that they convinced the irish population to drag their daughters off to the magdalene laundries and so the the they were being enslaved and the children trafficked for profit. And that continued, like the last one closed in 2006 and they were still doing, I mean, they were still running as per usual until at least 1996, like in Dublin. So that it's not that my mother was in a Magdalene laundry, but it sets the tone for the kind of country she came from. And she was a very traumatized kind of broken person who escaped Ireland and all the abuse she'd suffered there made it to England. And then they're telling her, you need to fuck off back home with your intersex baby. And, you know, Ugh. Ireland's still, I mean, you'll hear now that Ireland's not that Catholic anymore. It's not true. It's essentially the same power structure. It's just a, a lot of the power is held by relig- religious orders, uh, like now they're an NGO. We're not religious at all. We just happen to be founded while the Magdalene Laundries were in were in business um, by 
two of the religious orders that are notorious for enslaving and abusing people and trafficking babies. Like we're hearing about the, the bodies in the, in, the, in the Canadian schools now, but it's the same here. In one septic tank alone, they found almost 800 babies. And um, so it's, and, and the, the government's completely complicit. Like the, the government just published a, a report here that more or less absolved the church of any wrongdoing, you know, which is just, I mean, you know, the, the police were grabbing girls that had uh, escaped and returning them. And um, they were also taking children from families and giving them to the laundries. And, you know, we have a friend whose dad was taken from his family and abused by the clergy and then sold as farm labor to um, a farmer in Australia, you know, shipped out to Australia as slave labor. And my friend's younger than me, so it's really not that long ago. You know, it's, it's kind of business as usual. But that was the environment she came from, and then she moved back to it, you know, with, with me. So I was basically considered um, a bad omen, bad luck, you know, on the, <laughs> on the house. So it was, it was an odd start. And then the place that they moved to, is an, it's an interesting place. It's very strange. It's, it's hard to... It, it was a little bit of a, a, it was a little tough for a sensitive, effeminate kid like me, honestly. Um, that the name literally translates as plague grave or plague pit, the Tala. And it's a, it's an interesting place. It's very strange. It's, it's got a odd feel to it. We, it was a couple of years ago um, after we left America and moved back to Ireland. We moved back in 2017 with, with Trump and everything. And, People are walking into our tattoo shops and pointing guns at me after, you know, the whole trans uh, kickback, you know. So Ugh. we were like, yeah, we got to kind of go. Um, but there was a big winter storm that they called the Beast from the East. And we, we figured, you know, Leah's barely in Dublin. We'll go out and stand here, look at the snow, go back in and have cocoa. But in my old neighborhood, um, People were building snow banks to stop the police getting in. They robbed and burnt out all of the cars that were stranded. They started looting the grocery store, but they, but it was weird. They were like uh, doing like Snapchatting, Snapchat haul videos and taking the kids and the dog and I stay out to like loot the grocery store. And people just come in and go in, just coming out with boxes of Haribo candies and whatever. It was strange. And then during the blizzard at night, they were like, well, what can we do now? So they raided a construction site, robbed, uh, I don't know, JCB, I don't know what the digger, I don't know, um, from a construction site and took the roof off the supermarket and got the mm -hmm. safe out. We're trying to open it. And it's, a, it's, a, it's an odd place. But yeah, oh. that's where little delicate me grow, grew up. But, right. So born here and <laughs> over there. and Yeah, it's a whole thing. But I guess that's kind of the start of it. Um, I wasn't particularly popular. I was popular with some of the local dads, um, but I wasn't particularly popular in the neighborhood. I'm still not really. I'm a bad fit. We went back for a funeral um, while we were there. My, my neighbor, a few doors up, um, took her own life, and we went to funeral. Um, it was Leah's first Irish wake, maybe last. Um, and... Uh, I really tried to tone it down. I think my hair was bright pink at the time, but it, I, I, people were not really thrilled that I was there. And, uh, but I, you know, I fit in just as well as a kiddo, but I sort of fell into incidental sex work kind of pretty early. Um, I dabbled disastrously in street work. You know, I just, um, did that for a bit. Um, then I migrated. I, I moved to the U.S. at uh, 21. I got a Morrison visa and got to the U.S. and did a bit of sex work in New York and worked in an art store, which is cool. I was working on finding myself, really, and um, figuring out who I was. Um, but then ended up uh, with babies, long story short. So... I basically had to go back in the closet to hang on to the kiddos and uh, lots of different stuff. I, I had a lot of issues at the time while raising. I ended up 
I was a single parent of twins and there was a lot of things I was sort of uh, messing with, uh, wrestling with um, that I sort of found out a lot later. Um, after the kids turned 18, like before they, they turned 18, I stockpiled a bunch of uh, hormones. I knew what I was supposed to take. So I got a bunch off the black market. And it's, it's kind of a, it's really difficult to get your hands on a prescription, you know, and, and, and oh, you've got a kitty? Yay, Zoom kitties. Um, I'd stockpiled a bunch of hormones while trying to get my official prescription and going through all the therapist, therapist stuff. I'm, I'm zooming right through, but, um, and, uh, up until that point, I, I was put on, um, hormones pre-puberty. It's, it's a common thing with the, with his kids. Also a lot of intersex uh, people are put on, like I, I underwent surgeries and in, in, sorry, I'm bouncing back and forth like a, Perfect. Like, a like a six foot tall flea. Um, <laughs> the, I underwent surgeries in America or in, or in England, sorry, under the NHS uh, before they sent me back. And uh, I still have difficulties from those, but that's one of the things that, Basically, I'm researching in my PhD that there, there's no real recourse for them. You know, I mean, we still do these surgeries on 1.7% of the population. But when you go, I'm having problems with it. So jumping again. Addy. The whole thing with uh, John Money was that, which I know you know, um, that his whole thing was that basically all babies are, are their gender is fluid until they're, it's two. I don't know what happens at two, but the gender fairy comes and cements it. And wherever you're, it's like, you know, you make it, don't make a face because wind will change and your face will stay like that. That's how gender works, according to John Money. So the wind blows when you're two and whatever you're doing at the time, it sticks. And, you know, that's why some people's gender is dinosaur. I don't know. Um, <laughs> I was just going to say, I'm pretty sure my gender was Hot Wheels and Tiara. <laughs> yeah, I'm thinking that. I would definitely be leaning more towards uh, um, the Tiara, probably. Um, but yeah. I had some Hot Wheels, though. Um, <laughs> Maddie, do you mind quickly, just for uh, listeners and viewers uh, less familiar with like uh, terms like intersex, even though that is, you know, most people should know, but it's, um, would you feel comfortable just quickly giving everyone an explanation sort of of intersex and uh, just for, yeah, for anyone? <laughs> well, it's hard to get the the exact numbers for how many people are born intersex. Um but the UN puts it at around 1.7% of the population. Um, but it could be more uh, environmental deregulation. Looks like it's possibly contributing to intersex births and so on and so forth. And we may have more going forward. But, but countries like Ireland don't keep any data whatsoever. They do the surgeries, but they don't keep any data. So... Um, and I don't think that's an accident. Yeah. Um, but intersex is um, an umbrella term for bodily characteristics that don't fit neatly into strict binary medical categories of male and female, I suppose. And there's a lot of different intersex variations. There's a lot of different types and for a lot of different reasons, you know. So, um, but basically the John Money model was you take them and you shoehorn them through surgery into boy or girl. And if it doesn't work out, well, that's the parents' fault because they were inconsistent in their parenting and it's their fault. Definitely not my mm. craft theory, you know. But then also you must hide all of the information from them because it's dark and shameful and uh, it will interfere with their consistent up upbringing. You know? And now doctors will admit that there's a lot of uh, um, gender dysphoria and like there's a higher number of trans people amongst the intersex community. And while not all intersex people are, are trans and not all trans people are intersex, but the numbers are higher amongst, amongst intersex people, which kind of makes sense. And also too, doctors are admitting more and more that they don't get it right when they assign the gender. It's just they, you know, they get it wrong a lot of the time. They didn't get it right with me. And I know I know a bunch of other intersex people that are 
assigned the wrong gender at birth. But um, but because our gender is hidden from us, and I mean, in my case, I knew uh, my parents were pretty bitter about the whole thing, so I heard about it a lot, which is good and bad, I suppose. Um, when people are going to the doctors with their issues, um, they're not going high on intersex. So we've had half a century of people just struggling with whatever issues they had. And maybe, and, and you got doctors, I, I've met so many doctors down through the years who don't even know what intersex is. You got to educate the doctor. They just, they have no clue. Like nobody knows. It's basically hidden. So there's a lot of information about what happens to babies. Then zilch, or like they flip a coin, do some surgery and yeet us into the universe. Good luck. And they will say that, you know, when they, when they hear people like me complain, they'll go up. Uh, well, you're hearing from a very angry minority, but most of them are really happy, which is really interesting because you hear the same thing in sex work too. So every time anybody complains, they go, they, you, you'll on one hand, like for example, in Ireland, uh, an NGO founded by two of those religious orders while the laundries were in full swing. They brought in laws in 2017. They're the same sex work laws that are in Canada, the, the client criminalization. And it's been a complete disaster in Ireland. I mean, as a, a, a predictively, you know, if you look on the on the internet, the only research you find in support of it is Nordic model now, which is some uh, pro-Nordic model organization. And then Julie Bindle, who, you know, every, you know, turfs were extraordinary. But um, yeah, uh, yeah, they, they, they brought in a law that um, criminalizes the client and that's supposed to be basically, I'm jumping all over the place. This is um, perfect. Let's go for it. It's uh, yeah, you're just telling us your story. So yeah, you have to jump. You have to jump in time. Yeah. Um, Feels very organic to me. Yeah. And I enjoy having the facts mixed in with your personal experience. Yes, yeah, it's perfect. You're way too kind. <laughs> it's also how my brain thinks. So, I mean, it works. Yeah, yeah I think all of us have the same brain. <laughs> yeah, it's more and more. It's kind of weird because I'm, I met Leah, who at the time, um, I really thought that uh, she was uh, an imaginary like stress coping mechanism. <laughs> I was just like, she'd have to suck on some level to be real, you know? And it's just like, we, but we're just, it's just being so seamless. And it's just, it's weird. But yeah, more and more we find out we've got, so many of the same things and we both got the same ADHD and <laughs> it's about, you know, it's all about finding someone with compatible mental illnesses. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, that's where I was. Um, yeah. They put me on a, like a lot of people who get put on. Um, so with intersex surgeries, they perform a lot of uh, castrations on intersex children for no real reason. A lot of people are told that they have cancerous ovaries or potentially cancerous ovaries, but they're removing testes. Like the, the saying in intersex amongst doctors for a long time um, was it's easier to dig a hole than build a pole. So a lot of babies were, uh, a lot more babies were assigned uh, female. And also based on Dr. John Money's theory, he, he ran with the Freud thing that the clitoris serves no purpose. So they're still, they won't admit now that they keep changing the name, uh, clitorectomy, the clitoral reduction and clitoroplasty, but it'll basically just, it's, it's FGM under another name. I mean, Ireland condemns FGM while performing IGM, intersex genital mutilation. It's the same thing. And also too, doctors will look at babies and go, well, that's a small pecker. And I'm like, well, of course it is. It's a fucking baby. I mean, when was a baby ever born? And you're like, whoa, look at the size of the dick on that baby. You know? I mean, that would be a really weird thing to think, too. If you're like, oh, look at this baby, man. Look at that dick. Look at <laughs> yeah. this thing, like, 
their dick is massive. They'll grow into it. It's fine. You know, just like, <laughs> but like, and I, I don't think there's a correlation between the size of a baby's penis and how big it is an, as an adult. And also people, small penises, like learn, learn some, you know, learn some skills. There's no, there's no evidence that shows anybody's any less happy, you know, and, but they would look at those and go, well, who would want that? Let's assign them as a female and let's make them a vagina. And then just, it's just, it's kind of, it's pretty fucked. Really fucked. And it's a lot of, I mean, I, I know we're all only, like we all project on other people and we're only capable of doing that from the place, from our own experiences. But here you got these middle-class doctors, um, endocrinologists and neurologists, I guess projecting their own life. Because I mean, they handed me to a pair of kind of fucking idiots you know kind of just really traumatic uh, fragile people and, and damaged people and, and there's a lot of a lot of variables in that you know um but yeah uh, one of the results of that of the um of the meds i was put on pre-puberty and this made school really really difficult so it's really weird to come back to school and find it's a breeze <laughs> uh, not a breeze like it's work but it's it's a lot better this go around than, than primary and secondary school. But um, primary school, I just got the shit beat out of me the whole time because I was a tall, effeminate, weirdo kid. Um, now I'm just a tall, weir- uh, effeminate, weirdo, middle-aged person. <laughs> but, um, but then uh, I stopped sleeping after I went on meds. I was uh, awake. Basically, for the rest of my life until 42, I was awake six days a week. What? and uh but narcoleptic the whole time and, you know in america you gotta you gotta drive and it's just everyone has to drive and so i was in america from the age of 21 and like completely narcoleptic and like, i have no idea how i'm not dead how the kids aren't dead lots of wrecks like um uh, i mean our first my first date with leah i crashed the car i parked it on a wall with none <laughs> of the four tires touching <laughs> um first date and she didn't freak out so i knew she <laughs> she's the one <laughs> yeah um but yeah i was i was just a narcoleptic i had no idea what it felt like to fall asleep i would just wake up and i would do that all the time i, I work um i would occasionally work construction i grew up in construction my family had a construction business and i never enjoyed it um ev- almost every guy in my whole family is a carpenter and I did it. I'm just always being bad to mediocre at it. But um, but yeah, I would come to falling off the scaffolding with a power <laughs> tool or, or come to and your fingers over there and, you know, just uh, <laughs> come to and there's a sauce parked in your shin. Like, well, that's not ideal. Just but tiny little accidents. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I also had no real bodily sensation. Like I was kind of, uh, there's other people too. Ian Moreland talks about that. Like, you know, I had no sensation down there, like nothing. There's still very, very little. Um, I could still probably nail it to a door or something and like <laughs> be fine. Um, but the rest of me is pretty damn sensitive now. Um, go HRT. Um, but yeah, I got on my illegal HRT um, the day after the t- kids turned 18 and I had a stockpile. And uh, it was crazy. I fell asleep for the first time ever. And for the first time in my life, I was like, holy shit, I'm falling asleep. I can feel myself fall asleep. And, and also, most of my depression went poof. Because I'd spent all this time assuming was, uh, that I was suicidal because my life... So- like, who, who wouldn't? You know, like, you had that childhood. You went through IGM, um, fucking monster parents uh, in one of the most notorious areas of Dublin, which makes me sound way more gangster than I am uh, being from there. I don't deserve that street cred. I should give it back. There should be a ceremony or something. <laughs> um, then um, then I moved to New York because, oh yeah, when, when I was 10, <laughs> well, when I was a kid, all those movies in New York, I, I would see them and there'd be people like me in them. And it was like trans sex workers. And I was just like, and drag queens, and I'm like, oh my god, there's people like me. I need to move there because all, the only other representations of people like me were serial killers, you know. And like, if if every representation you see of yourself is a, a serial killer, like, well, that sucks. I don't think I'm very serial killery. 
So I, I, I read a lot about serial killers. It just turns out it was Hollywood dicks projecting and, you know, and just. Oh, yeah. Didn't they make a regulation that said something about how trans women could be in films, but only if they were portrayed as being super fucked up or something like that? I can't remember mm-hmm. the rule itself. Yeah, but, I, didn't, I didn't know it was official, but. I yeah, mean, it was an old school official thing. I will look it up because I want to get this right. So please continue telling your story. And if there's a good moment, I'll be like, I found the thing. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's really that's interesting. No, I I don't think I knew that. But yeah, in New York, like for example, um, Ford Apache the Bronx started off with Pam Greer shooting a cop, and she's so beautiful. And uh, so we we're already off to a good start. And then there was trans characters in the movie, and the neighbors didn't hate them. Like it wasn't. I mean, they jeer them a bit, but I'm like that. That's way different the reception than I'm getting. <laughs> So um, I was like, I want to move there. It just looked beautiful and diverse. And it took me years to realize all those movies were about how bad New York was supposed to be. <laughs> and I went right over my head. Like I lived there. I, I like I moved there while the murder rate was at its peak. And I'm like, it, this is great. And, and I really was though. Like I, I lived in a, a building that's kind of notorious. And I just, this is... It was great. It was, oh, more Zoom Kitty. Is it, wait, is that the same cat that just walked through yours? It's a magical Zoom Kitty and just walking, yeah, appearing exactly, in. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> same one. That's Finch, right, Kennedy? Yeah, he's driving me nuts. <laughs> it's because oh, it's fine. My go next. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, just uh, years later, I saw, uh, I went back to New York with, with my wife. Um, Leah, we went to a wedding in New York and it was an exhibition about Fort Apache, the Bronx. And it was all about how the neighbors were protesting the movie because it would make, it would make look, New York look bad. And there's me going like, oh my God, what a wonderful, diverse place. It's so mm-hmm. accepting. And, you know, so, yeah, but I moved there and it really was. I mean, I, I found all these wonderful queer people. I mean, there was, there was, a, there was a drag store the size of a, a city block, a Lee's oh, Mardi Gras. It was so huge. It was like in the meat packing district. That's cool. And it was just a, and it was around the time they were, they were uh, recruiting at the time for our uh, auditioning for To Wu Fong, Thanks for Everything. And, and there was flyers in Lee's Mardi Gras. And also um, the, my coworkers, I worked at this art store that's, a really beloved art store. It's kind of a New York institution. Like I couldn't wait to go back and visit, but it literally closed the month before we made it back to New York. I'm just like, God damn it. <laughs> but um, my coworkers chipped in and bought me my first pair of brand new heels. You know, it just, it was great. You know, so having to pack that all in when babies came along, I love my babies and they've really helped me grow up a lot, but you know, uh, it wasn't the timing really wasn't ideal for me because I was really trying to fig- find, figure myself out, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I thought maybe that's why I was always suicidal. Uh, I think part of it, but um, I was also just not, I was, I was narcoleptic the whole time and just, I was sleeping one day a week and that continued till I got access to HRT and all of a sudden, poof, most of my depression just took off, which is really wild because I'd never, and I'd been seeing doctors over and over and over again and just no just no luck um but yeah turns out hormones are magic my my doses are still way way low i mean it's kind of wild as a baby because if i want to get seen i am basically waiting for trans care because they get their gender assignment wrong and the waiting list for trans stuff is years like Mm -hmm. yeah like uh that what the, the reason I end up back in school, you got to turn all your frowns upside down um, or do your best to anyway. I think it's kind of revenge. You know, it's something you can do, you know, like they punch you and like, oh, good. I want to be punched there because I don't know, insert whatever reason. <laughs> um, they, I, I, when I moved back to Ireland in 2017, I knew it was going to hit me, but a lot of just old memories came flooding back and I was suicidal in no time. And in many ways, I really just always fit in. Like I left Ireland where I didn't really have a lot of community. There really wasn't any. I still don't know if there's a lot of LGBT community in Tala. I mean, I know there's LGBT people there. I don't know. Maybe there is now. But there wasn't as far as I was aware when I was a kid. And um, 
I moved to New York and instantly had all this fucking community. Just like, boom, you got all these friends and it's just, well, this is easy, you know? And just, and despite being kind of, I don't know, despite not realizing until years later that all those movies were about how bad New York was. I was right though. I mean, I really did. I fit in. All of a sudden I was in a place where I fit in and it was great. And just, you know, three in the morning, you know, going with your friends to see their, your other friend's art show and going and get Indian food at like six in the morning. And it was perfect. For me, it was perfect. And it was, you know, that's when New York is supposed to be at its worst, you know? But yeah, absolutely. I really loved it. Um, it was wonderful to me. Like, yeah. Yeah, it was magical. I mean, I even, I mean, it was, it was wild, but it was just so, I mean, you could just be whatever the hell you wanted to be. There's just the, 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 the Lower East, I, I, well, I lived in a few places, but um, last I lived in the Lower East Side and it was just so vibrant all the time and just so diverse and interesting. And it was, and I think in many ways, I'm still trying to kind of get back there. I mean, we're still working on our German Duolingo, so we might be ready for Berlin, you know, like it's, I don't know, it'd be nice. Um, um he, sorry, uh, you know, June, you know, Hida Valoria, um, the like, so the memoir Born Both, and then also Hillman has a um, memoir. Um, and in both of them, they talk about San Francisco and that kind of community and both say how like they could let go or release their multiplicity. And they like their multiplicity could be at ease there. That's what it was. And yeah, this idea of people of like all kinds coming together and like recognizing that you know they're the same and you feel at home and it's so important eh like that must have been hard to leave that too it was it really broke my heart and the, the irony is I moved to New York as a, a new parent um and or no to San Francisco um so I was in San Francisco in the mid 90s but under the circumstances of being in a pretty terrible relationship and being a brand new parent in my early twenties of identical twins, you know? So I wasn't really getting to do all the fun queer shit that I could have been under other circumstances. Like Leah and I talk about that. It's like, if we'd raise the kids together, I mean, it's all good. I'm in a good place now. Who cares? You know, and we wouldn't have this without that and so on and so forth, but it would be pretty fun to be able to, you know, we got our hands on the TARDIS. We would just be going back to nineties, New York and, 90 San Francisco back and forth just ding 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 (laughs) yes totally we'll have to all go together in the future yes yes let's do that for sure there's Berlin (laughs) I mean that's pretty (laughs) and you know Austin's a lot like that too Austin was a Austin was a pretty good fit and it was just pretty queer you know nice and like Austin was a was a good place but we're still you know we're still glad I mean it's it's been tough in between here and there it's been good since we've been here, which is, you know, um, since September last year, nearly a year, I suppose. Come on up on a year. Just passed my ethics today. So such good news. Woo! Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're doing so many, so many things. Addie's chapter on um intersex and um and older adults is uh, just magnificent. So yeah, I just we're so excited to have it part of the collection. And yeah, I want to talk about so many things. So yeah, I should let you just keep going with your story and then it will lead because you're so good at just like, we don't have to do anything. <laughs> yeah, just, we can just listen to you and yeah, be wrapped up in what you're saying. It's fine. <laughs> like heaven, this works perfectly. <laughs> what do you think, Nas? Actually giving you the platform, please. Yeah. I yeah. love hearing your stories. I feel yeah. like like everyone needs to hear this and this is a great opportunity to get that and it flows so perfectly so please continue <laughs> you're way too kind <laughs> so soothing <laughs> isn't that true oh, thank you it's because i smoke a lot of weed <laughs> <laughs> that's what i've been doing wrong yeah. <laughs> but yeah just keep going we love you um yeah i don't know it's a. Uh, yeah so yeah i was in i was in i lived in I lived actually actually right around the corner from, you know, the armory. If you look at like King Top Kong clips, the, the, they show the armory and the, the big castle. And I lived around the corner from there before it became, you know, I don't think it is anymore. I don't think they're making porn there anymore either. It's just, it's state, but they were for a while, but it was cool. You could take a tour of it. And it was, they actually have, uh, they had their, the robot from short circuit, I guess the guy who owned it, but, um, what is it, Johnny Five or whatever? And 
So Johnny Five had a career as a porn star, as a robot porn star. For, so there's your robot tattoo. I was yeah. thinking exactly that. Yeah. <laughs> and we actually have a friend who made a movie with him as well. So in that place. So. Yeah. Yeah, he became a porn star. So there's a documentary needs to be made. Yeah. Yeah. The career of Johnny Five. Yeah, I, I don't know. Um, yeah, oh, that's what I was saying. Um, we moved back to... Uh, to Ireland and I wasn't doing good. It hit me like a wall, like a ton of bricks. And uh, I called that. I reached out to my doctor. My doctor said, um, yeah, I've, you got to go to your GP and your GP recommends you on to, um, to a psychiatrist uh, for antidepressants. And I have mixed feelings about antidepressants, but if they work, they work. And I was like, fuck, I'll do anything right now. So um, she was like, actually, it is good because this is the guy who used to be the uh, head psychiatrist for the National Gender Service. So perfect. And I had already gotten on the the, um, the waiting list for care as a trans person. You know, I was already on it. I was on it in summer of 2017. And I got no information, no callback from the, the psychiatrist. And then finally, I just I, I asked the doctors, like, can I have his number? called got a secretary and she was like but you're trans and intersex and i was like yeah i know <laughs> you know and uh you've got to go to lachlan's town as that i'm aware i'm on the list but i'm not trying to see you for i'm not trying to see him for trans issues it's separate but overlapping i suppose but i want i just want to get a prescription for antidepressants well call us back and um we'll call you back uh some you know and they didn't and I phoned back again and they were like, no, we're not going to see you. What? You need to go to Lachlan's town, which is the one hospital in Ireland. Like Ireland's doing surgery on, on presumably 1.7% of the population. And then if you need any issues, you get on there. Like I got on the waiting list in 2017. So instead of killing myself, unless I'm a ghost, uh, maybe I did so. <laughs> um, <laughs> explain the whole nonsense ghost story i was, I was just going to say yeah, maybe yeah. that's also you yeah <laughs> yes that, that would right? also be <laughs> new drag persona <laughs> yeah totally. um, uh i i went back to school instead and like i went back, back to school and uh on hrt it's been so much fucking easier like it's just that school was so tough and i did really poorly in everything and uh going back now it's just like wow this is a lot easier um for me, I'm not saying it's easy. It's just easier for me than it was in secondary and primary school. And uh, now I'm working on, I'm on my PhD. So it might actually be quicker in Ireland to become a doctor than be seen by a doctor if you're trans. So, so yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I shouldn't laugh about that. Like, that. Yeah, what I an know. incredible way please. to frame it. Yeah, it's a bit nuts, isn't it? Like, I mean, like, it just, yeah. I mean... I know so many girls that I've I've tattooed down to the years that are on the same meds, you know, for uh, on spironolactone or aldactone and estrogen, whatever. Like it's just the same shit anyone else can get. But like, well, for you, I mean, I had to go through a bunch of therapists to like, well, let's make sure. I mean, you already did fucking surgery on me. Like it's 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 not I mean, this whole thing where you're going to go from male to female. Like I was born somewhere in the middle. And you are, so I'm just sort of, and the thing is too, there's so many, the much turfy shit, you know, about, well, there's lots of uh, feminine, whatever. I was really bad at being a boy and everybody thought so. Like, and even when I got a bit older and I, I and even though I wasn't necessarily out um, as an adult, I was open about it. Um, I've never lied about it. I would just be open about it. I would tell people what I was, you know, and uh, no false expectations. And then girls would complain. It was, it was like, it was like going to bed with a girl. And it's like, hey, well, I, you know, I did tell you, but, you know, but they wanted something rugged, you know. People are, yeah. Ugh. Yeah. I was tattooing somebody and they'd be like, oh, I could just picture you carrying me into, I didn't get this a lot. I'd get occasionally. I think most of the time they're just trying to get free tattoos or something. I don't know. But they were like, uh, I picture you carrying me into a castle. And I'd be like, well, a Princess Fantasies too. So I'm not sure we're compatible. <laughs> um, also, what if you want to be carried into a castle yeah, sometimes? You deserve that if that's what you want. 
Mm-hmm. Well, that's why Leah and I are doing yoga in the morning, so she can build up those muscles. <laughs> Perfect. So she can carry my large ass into a castle. <laughs> in a wheelbarrow. A wheelbarrow will work. Yeah. <laughs> Wheel me. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> my favorite things, Addy, I've said this before, but like um, just this ability, uh, Nas, does, all of you do this, but yeah, but especially with Addy, when you're telling your story, which is so traumatic, but then we're just like laughing our asses off at the same time, right? It's something really traumatic and we're like, ah! <laughs> so it's an amazing ability and you're amazing. You know what though too, like I, I, I sort of, I mean, kind of fuck him, you know, fuck John Money. Yeah, fuck that fuck guy. My, shite parents fuck all those fucking people my, my, you know uh, like fuck the doctor wouldn't see me fuck it La- we're gonna laugh and the thing is I- i've told my kids this a long time ago and when they're growing up i was like the best revenge you can have is a better life than there is fill your life with beautiful people and i mean the thing is we don't have jeff bezos power or money we can't like that's the thing like the the, the ngos who were founded by the nuns in ireland have so much power and influence and hmm. They still, they just run all the, they run everything. Like the, the, you, you can't really compete with it. But what you can do while doing your best to fuck up their shit is have a good fucking life despite them. Yep. Do the things you want to do and fill your life with wonderful people. And I'm not going to give them the satisfaction, you know, like have a better relationship than them, raise better fucking kids, you know, like live an authentic life because they're not, you know. Otherwise, they wouldn't be all up in your shit, you know. They would be figuring out whatever it is they like to do, you know, going to a marriage counselor or whatever they need to do, you know. Well, instead of, you know, trying to jail sex workers and shit. It's, yeah, that's uh, not- you know. Oh yeah. On a way lower level, that reminds me of every time I talk to someone about anxiety, and they're like, "Have you meditated recently?" <laughs> I'm like maybe maybe you need to meditate. You know, I actually have, but, but thanks for asking, I guess. Yeah. Have you tried going outside? Like that's what gives <laughs> anxiety. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, that's the thing. Like I'm not making light of COVID. I'm really not like I'm, I'm aware of how, I mean, I, I caught COVID pretty early on. Was pretty sure I wasn't going to make it, but I'm like a cucaracha. I'm hard to get rid of. <laughs> apparently. Um, but for someone that, likes to just stay at their desk i mean i'd actually been asking leah i'd I'd been asking the universe for so maybe it's all my fault i'm not sure um more time for exams because i've been really busy with activist stuff um because the the laws that are in ireland the client criminalization laws were up for review and uh, that review who knows i guess it's still in progress and i don't i don't have high hopes i really don't because again the nuns run the country just it's no longer, they're not in non habits. It's rich, middle class women who know better than everybody else, you know, and they're running all these NGOs on fat salaries, bringing in millions. And every time you hear about these Swedish model laws coming in, it's always accompanied with talk of exit programs. And there is no, I mean, crazy, wild, uh, big brain idea here, but maybe bring in the exit supports first, see how they go before you start arresting people for working together and deporting and evicting people, you know, maybe wild idea. I mean, I guess do your thing, which they did, you know, I mean, they brought the laws in in Ireland and it got bad. I mean, I don't know. I posted there on Twitter the other day. There was like a, on, on, on Instagram, but um, the headline of the Irish times where, you know, it's, it's, on one hand, you're hearing that the church is gone in Ireland, but it's 2021 and Catholic bishops are writing the sex ad for our primary schools. Like Catholic fucking bishops, you know? I mean, and we know that they have septic tanks full of dead babies. They were trafficking. I mean, the last place closed in 2006, the last prison for women. And where these fuckers run the country. Yeah, you don't really want people with that little of a clue of what consent actually means teaching sex ed, let alone the fact of the lack of education and knowledge in that area. Well, it's also like everywhere, most places, HIV is going down. Ireland's one of the few places where it's continuing to skyrocket. Oh, wow. But but also, I mean, all of our schools are 
church run. So, I mean, like I left, I was gone for nearly 30 years. And of course I'm hearing about how, um, how much better everything got. And some things did get better. Like uh, since I, while I was home, the eighth was repealed. So people can actually access abortion. Marriage equality happened before I moved home. Those are good things. They shouldn't have been gone in the first place, you know. But there's a there's a lot of shit that just has a, has a long way to go. It's uh, it's bad. But um, I, I sat down with uh, well, okay, getting ahead of myself again. Um, because I'm perpetually naive. Like Leah and our kids are pretty protective of me because. Apparently, on just some major level, I'm a complete idiot, and uh, they feel they got to watch out for me, you know. And I'll just get myself in trouble, which I do, you know. And I'm, I'm I don't know, I'm just inherently trusting. I'm just like stuck on that. And the, the, my kids and Leah are very, our kids are um, really protective of me. But uh, so we went back to Ireland, and we're like, well, just to be sure, let's uh, let's make sure. Um, it's legal to do this. And we went and met with a lawyer and they're like, yep, completely legal. Great. So we literally sank everything we had into opening a place to work from as dominatrix. Cause I guess I'm getting ahead of myself because um, the day after the kids turned 18, I decided, well, I'm a coward if I don't just, I wanted to give them, I wanted to give them the, I don't judge other people for however they handle their bullshit. It's not an ideal world, but, I really wanted to give the kids the most, uh, they didn't get a normal childhood by any stretch. I mean, they grew up in tattoo shops for the most part. And I was, uh, it was wild. I mean, we lived a lot of places, moved around a lot. It was a lot of, a lot of weird shit. Um, but I knew a lot of things not to do as a parent. So I was actually a pretty good parent, honestly. I mean, I, I parented myself. Uh, I'd been more or less my own mother and father. And so I had some practice before the kiddos came along. Um, but Can I, I ask you a question about your kids? Yeah. So being raised in tattoo shops and surprisingly mm. well-traveled, it sounds like for a lot of kids, uh, mm. kids rebel or have they rebelled in any really interesting ways that aren't kind of expected? Yeah, they're normal. <laughs> <laughs> they're like that's- yeah, there, we. I mean, it's kind of like I feel like I've succeeded and failed at the same time because I think we'd be, and we kind of are. We got a lot of kind of a adoptee, like sex worker kids, and you know, and we get a lot of Mom's Day cards from from sex workers. And but um, our kids are, uh, yeah. I feel like we'd be really good parents for like queer kids or trans kids, or whatever. And, no, our kids are super normal. They're really balanced. They don't have any of my issues. They're like, they're just kind of charismatic, cool, funny. They're like way cool. They're you like just described yourself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're they're just like, yeah, they're cool. And I'm just and they're really normal and really good. They're really just good, um, good, good guys, you know? It's uh That's because of really- you. Yeah, congratulations. Like, you clearly put <laughs> yeah. some work in there and you went through all of that shit and well, your kids I, turned out fairly stable and fine and happy. Oh, yeah. They're, they're along the way you did so, right, for them to turn out that way. Yeah. yeah that, through the chaos, you did something right along the way to make. Yeah. I, 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 oh, sorry. <laughs> I always have to do that too. <laughs> yeah, I have no idea. I, I, I'm blaming autism. I don't know when to jump in and I'm just really bad at it. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how I make it across the street alive. <laughs> I, I I think it's a combo of good and bad luck. Like, cause I think if ever if everything had gone well, gone well, you know, quote unquote, um, I would have had money for. I had one babysitter ever, one the entire time, oh and that was a, like uh, a guy I tattooed with. He was a piercer, and he he said. He, he's a whole he's a whole podcast into himself he's no longer with us um but he said my girlfriend who, who i liked and i knew she'll watch the kids um if you're a designated driver and drive us to this corrosion of conformity concert in tampa and uh i was like sure you know why not i'd never had a babysitter and the kids weren't that small at that point you know and 
And uh, we were at the show 15 minutes and four people were stabbed right in front of us and had testified a murder trial. The one time I had a fucking babysitter. Yeah, you can probably Google it. It's probably still in the papers, probably comes up. But yeah, um, yeah, like we're, we're real close to. And like it was, it was a whole thing. Yeah, it was. Yeah. The one time I got a babysitter. Yeah. Oh, me. Oh, yes. me. You don't get a break. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, well, that's the thing too. I think like, just circumstances cause like I couldn't leave the kids at home. Their mom caused a lot of trouble. She was calling the police with all kinds of wild shit. Like, you know how you're when you're in a relationship and you blame them for everything and they leave and you realize half of it's your bullshit. Like, no, when she left, everything just got good. It was like a Disney commercial, a Disney uh, like movie, like the clouds part of the sun shone and you're walking along and the birdies are all on the telegraph wire singing a tune. You know, like, I, at that, to that point, I chain smoked from about the age of seven. I stopped smoking. I never, I didn't even give them up. I just never smoked again. Wow. The kids' health improved. Their grades shot up. The power stayed on. We stopped getting evicted. It was just like, life just got, it was just like, holy crap, it was all you. Oh my God, you know? And, um, and yeah, life was suddenly good. Um, wait, I've lost my train of thought a bit. Um, but oh yeah. So basically I couldn't leave the kids at home. I mean, like we'd be home and the cops would like kick in our door, guns drawn. And then, you know, meanwhile, we literally just done grocery shopping. Um, you know, the kids are playing chess at the table, the Valdi's playing and the cops are like, Oh, well, sorry about your door. And, you know, and I end up tattooing all the child services down there. And a lot of people from the court and the courts were not in favor of, uh, trans um person raising kids and uh especially if they were tattooing also and that was all um didn't really go my favor they didn't they, i never really got custody but they also never really got the kids either so basically at one point my custody judge retired and their mom was just out of the picture and we just bailed and moved to texas we just ran for the border a few people at the courthouse that i tattooed um gave me the heads up and said Hey, he just retired. So you may want to bail before they appoint anyone else. Because once you're Florida is the only place where I think or one of the only places where kids can't choose which parent they want to live with until they're 18, which doesn't make any sense. Nope. And also the same year, like we were yeah, that's made go see a court appointed guy whose specialty was like gay conversion therapy. And it wasn't working for him. Um, but Basically, there's there's a thing in Florida called the Baker Act, and it's supposed to be um, a suicide prevention thing, but it's not. It's it's so abused. Like there's there's uh, people are Baker Acting their family members left, right, and center. Couples getting in fights and Baker Acting each other, and when you call the police, there's no take backs. You're getting locked away for three days and drugged up, and then you get out three days later. But these places are making a fortune off it, you know, and um. They were threatening to bake rack the kids if they wouldn't go and live with their mom, who they didn't really have a relationship with. It was ugly. It was just really, really bad. And we we bailed. We bailed to Texas. And uh, and then it was just better and, you know, better in a lot of ways. But I came out and that definitely uh, impacted my customer base. And we were already at the time, we were making some porn. And... Uh, doing yeah we were doing we were already kind of we we're not leah was full stop full time doing the uh doing sex work and working as a dom and we're filming and everything and i just started doing it too to make up for my shortage of customers uh and yeah we moved back to ireland and we're like uh yeah we sank everything into opening up a space and then we just started getting harassed we got raided by the police and then we got harassed for months and then finally evicted under the current laws. And we lost everything, you know, oh, we lost, we, we didn't have a fucking penny. We had nothing. We had no way to make money. Like I tried to get work. Um, ironically, like I was at a, I spoke at an intersex convention not that long ago. And uh, one of the people who sponsored the convention was a company that wouldn't hire me when they saw my passport, that I was <laughs> trans, you know, that I was um, legally female. So like you just can't get work. If, I mean, in Ireland, yeah, like yay, you can change your gender, but 
you're fucked when you try to get work or anything else. So there's sex work, but the police will evict you, you know. Ugh. And so, th- so there's a lot of stuff. So basically, um, we we really considered suicide for a long time. And it was a long road back. It was, uh, we really lost everything. I mean, if it wasn't for porn sales, I would have had to drop out of college because I had no way of making money. Um, and it was a rough, it was a rough road back. And I think we're still, I mean, Leah said the other day, like she really thinks she has PTSD just from the Irish police, you know, um, and from that whole experience, which, you know, I mean, I, I know she does. Of course. And, uh, but again, I don't know. I don't really want to give people the satisfaction. So fuck them, you know? And the thing is, there's a lot of people who like, one of the people that we got we got mother stay cards from this year contacted us there recently and her family found out like her mom and her aunt found out they found her only fans and she's disowned you know so she's like messaged like well you're my only mom's now you know and, and there's a lot of people in danger of like losing their families like the, the, the stigma in ireland and the repression is just off the charts you know like in in america for example Leah's family are pretty conservative. We know who they voted for. We won't mention it. Um, <laughs> they know what sh- they know. They know what we did for a living. They don't give a shit. They don't care, and they're conservative. In Ireland, you know, you tell people, you know, what you did. Like people ask what you did or what you do, and I'm like, well, do this, and they act like you, like you just told them you devour cute babies or something. <laughs> you know, just they they look horrified. They're just like. And, and, but it's it's you know like that's that's your bullshit that that's not it's not bouncing on me i mean that's the thing i am got into i mean i got into sex work well because i'm trans i trans really because i'm fucking intersex because you signed me the wrong fucking gender did surgery to match you basically made me a you you took my phallus made it a penis that's got <laughs> no sensation in it and it's really difficult to pee through on the plus side i get a lot of dueling go done in the bathroom waiting to try and pee so thank you surgeons for my really sketchy knowledge of german and Je- Je- uh, chinese and russian and all the other languages i'm trying to get cut at so there, there's a pl- you gotta find the plus sides fuck them like <laughs> well i'm here anyway may as well do dueling go yeah well, you know that all those people who are gonna get mildly offended or super offended at some point or another they're gonna google it like within the next week they're probably looking into whatever somebody says that they've done for a living because they are deadly curious about it which is why they don't want to talk about it oh yeah it's you know every time you hear about somebody's boss coming out and like that they we they found their only well how did you find my only fans jim you know like were you the guy? You're probably the guy that was sending the shitty messages that they didn't respond favorably to, and that's probably why, mm-hmm. you know. But it's uh, yeah, we make a we make a situation where people kind of have to turn to sex work, yeah, and then we punish them for it. But that makes sense. I mean, like, it doesn't make sense to do these, but it makes sense if you look at who's pushing for these laws. Like in Ireland, Ireland had in uh, what year was it? Like. I don't know, around 2009, um, a piece of quote-unquote research came out. And this research was sponsored by the Religious Sisters of Charity, who had been trafficking and enslaving women up until 1996. So it's only like, this is, I mean, like 13 years later, they're writing research. And I know just like, they, I can't remember the, the, the totals off the top of my head. But they were like, gave some number of like, this is a huge booming business. But then when you follow the little asterisks down, and this is calculated at uh, Ireland having 800 sex workers who work six days a week and make quarter of a million a year. Like, are you kidding? What? Like, so what are, what are you rescuing them from? Yeah. Like, so you want them to rescue them that into like working retail? Like, are you kidding me? They can make their own schedule and a quarter of a million a year. And of course, it's nonsense. I mean, I've talked to... Um, workers with disabilities in Ireland who are like, I make 400 a month, but it's, I'd starve without it. You know, like we have the land of a hundred thousand welcomes, Cade, me, La Falcha. We have concentration camps for refugees and asylum seekers. And there you get 38 bucks a week to live on. 
and they have to support their families on it. And these organizations could be fighting for the right for these people to work, which they're not allowed to, or to get more money. So these people are forced to do sex work. But if you, these organizations, they need you to, they need sex workers to exist, but they, and they need you miserable and they need you silent, you know? And anytime you speak up, that's the parallel with the intersection. You speak up, they're not representative, you know? Um, there's millions you know, with, 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 uh, with intersex doctors, you're hearing from, what is it? One quote I read today, you're only hearing from like 97% or whatever, completely happy with their surgeries. No data, of course, there's no follow-up. I've never had any follow-up, you know, nobody, I don't know anybody who's ever had any follow-up. Um, the only follow-up, the only stuff you, you read about is people who've had a uh, hypospadias surgeries where, and basically where they have to do surgeries to fuck up. I mean, the surgery isn't done for any medical reason at the start anyway, but they do surgeries to repair that surgery, then surgeries to repair that surgery and so on and so forth. And then when they get to the point when this is a person who can no longer urinate or have sex, they write it off as a hypospadias cripple. That's the words they use. And it wasn't a surgery they needed in the first fucking place, you know? Um, but you hear the same thing with the, with the anti-sex work crowd. Like you're only hearing from the non-representative that you're hearing from the pimp lobby. And 90% of the women are, Aryan virgins in chains uh, being held at gunpoint by non-white men and being sexually exploited because it's that old xenophobic hogwash. Uh, while acknowledging that it's because of inequality and poverty, but at the same time still, uh, you know. But, but yeah, basically this is so, again, bouncing all over the fucking place like a bean, like a jumping bean. Um, mm -hmm. this, this piece of research, quote-unquote research, came out from the Religious Sisters of Charity uh, who are that religious order. And then that law, that basically was the basement, the basis of basement Freudian slip there, uh, the basis <laughs> of uh, a movement called, they call turn off the red light. You know, I mean, these are people who fucking did human trafficking for decades and slavery unapologetically, unapologetically. Like and, and you mentioned in the papers recently about this, uh, they've come back and said, you're, that's elder abuse. Like you're bullying those nuns that did fucking, I mean, like, hey, you're trying, I mean, they, they were trying geriatric Nazis, but, you know, <laughs> if you if you, if you you say anything mean about the nuns, that's elder abuse. But, like, they did some abuse. I mean, I, I mean, I think if you found one baby in my septic tank, that would be grounds to look at me a little suspiciously, to say the least. If you found 800 babies in my septic tank, I'd probably get to become a government advisor. And in fairness, on the from the government's point of view, who better to advise the government on human trafficking than religious orders who actually did it for fucking nearly 100 years? So in fairness, from their perspective, they know their shit, you know? Uh, but the sad thing is they make, so they make a lot of profiting. Uh, 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 they get a lot of funding from this. So this turn off the red light movement in Ireland that brought in the um, client criminalization. It was led by Ruhama, which is an organization founded by the Good Shepherd Sisters and the Religious Sisters of Charity, like the nuns still sit on the board. Emigrant Council Ireland, which was founded by the Religious Sisters of Charity and the Religious Sisters of Charity themselves. Like it was only a short while before this that they, they were, they'd convinced Irish people to drag their pregnant daughters along and donate them as slaves to the church, you know, until 1996. And so this is only a few years later that they launched this campaign, Turn Off the Red Light, and they fought for an increase in, uh, in, in uh, penalties and fines for working together. Like, I mean, you never see cops by themselves, but every time you see, uh, but basically like girls now have to work alone, which means they're fucked if they're, alone or fucked that they're together because if they're together you can get them working together and that happened in in 2019 two young girls one is 20 and one is 25 one of them was pregnant no clients no money um but there was some condoms and they were arrested and convicted and sentenced to nine months in prison each for the sole crime of working together for safety 
You know, and so there's a little bit of money there. The judge made fun of them for how little money was present. They take that money and give it to the NGOs founded by the Religious Sisters of Charity. Uh, you know, and that's what they do. I mean, like, for example, there was, there was an Irish, there was a woman in Ireland not that long ago. I think she's a Brazilian woman. She was 73 and she was engaged in sex work to raise money for her child's, uh, her grown son's kidney operation. And they arrested her and took the 80 bucks she'd made and gave it to these the rich organizations founded by nuns um, that bring in millions in funding. Uh, but our, like, I mean, since, so since it came in, almost immediately violence skyrocketed against sex workers. Our HIV rates are at their highest. And the trafficking in persons report, if you look at that, um, the year the law came in in 2017, we were ranked amongst the best countries in the world for handling human trafficking. But um, with this law, they disbanded all of their human trafficking um, units in the police, and they put all the focus on sex workers, uh, basically, on and just rely on these non-founded and non-NGOs. So uh, we are now one of the worst countries in the world in only three years, like in just three years. We're Same. right hovering above the bottom, tier two watch list, so right above tier three. So mm -hmm. we're slightly better than Afghanistan for human trafficking right now. In just three years, HIV skyrocketed. So, so I, that's the thing. Like, a lot, it, there's a lot of people out there will lose their family, lose their social support. Um, they'll fuck them for any kind of a career. You know, my kids are grown. They can't take my kids because they, you know, kids get their sex workers get their kids taken all the time. Um, you know, they're getting evicted. We've already been evicted. You almost took my life. And I mean, if you'd taken my wife's life, I would have followed. And so you almost took my wife's life. It was, it was really touch and go for a long time. And, uh, you know, I've already, I, I, I'm not close to my family. I mean, like, okay, of course they kind of, no, they didn't cut me off first. They cut off my older brother first and uh, then cut off me. And now they have no, my parents have no contact with any of their, their kids, grandkids, great grandkids, nothing. Um, Sorry. But but moving home, we had aunts and uncles reaching out, telling me not to get in touch, you know, because I'm the, you know, Sorry. the bad and um, it's fine because, you know, when I was a kid, I really resented, like there's, there's, a, there's a custom called Boxing Day mm -hmm. where every, the day after Christmas, you got to go visit your, your um, you go visit rich people and they give you their old crap in a box and it's Boxing Day, you know, in Ireland it's Stephen's Day, but, but we would kind of fucking do that. We would go visit our rich relatives. They weren't that rich. They just thought they were, they just thought they were better than us, you know. Yeah. Our posher relatives, and we, my parents would kind of buy into the whole play into the whole poor relatives visiting the rich people, and it's fucking miserable. Like they're just so. When I was a kid, it's like I don't really want to be here. So, as luck would have it, many years later they said, "Don't reach out to us when you're in Ireland, and don't come visit." And so, yes, dreams yeah. come true. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I wanted to meet the cops um, about this. I I I, I talked about some research I was working on at a criminology conference in Cork. And the head of the cops, Drew Harris, um, gave the closing remarks. And I thought it would be a bit contentious to start hollering at him from the, from the audience. But <laughs> so I wrote him an email and I said that like, I, I wanted to yell at you, but um, the police sent back eventually. I didn't think I'd hear back. Mm -hmm. They sent me back a, a letter, an email with the response from everybody in the entire chain of command. And I'm like going through, oh, I don't think I'm supposed to be seeing these at all. And then another email came that said, unsend previous email, which <laughs> I thought was really funny. And then they sent me the one I was supposed to get. And um, so, yeah, um, I went with a bunch of sex workers and uh, we had a meeting with the head of the cops, the head of the vice unit operation quest and the head of human trafficking. Oh. And, uh, it was it was really interesting because we actually had a meeting with the the senior police in Northern Ireland, same, uh, and it turned out it was the same day, just by coincidence. So wow. we had senior police in Ireland, senior police in Northern Ireland, and but the police, the, the the meeting in Northern Ireland contrasted so sharply with the police in in the Republic of Ireland mm -hmm. that we ended up hugging the senior PSNI in Northern Ireland, like just like 
Yes. And I, I, you know, I know they do shady shit, but they showed up and they were like, here's two liaison officers. Whereas like the, the phone number for Irish sex workers to call in, like in, in the Republic of Ireland had gone on man for like two fucking years, you know? And, mm-hmm. But I wanted to talk with the cops about trust um, because I'd gotten a call from somebody at three in the morning. You know, you know the Kitty Genevieve story? I don't. Um, I mean, the, the story is not accurate. It's always sounded weird to me. And then actually there's a noisy vehicle. There's, um, I think it's uh, the podcast You're Wrong About did an episode on it. They're, they're really, really great. They do great episodes on trafficking and everything too, and moral panic, because that's what this is. Um, they uh, Basically, this, this story of Kitty, Kitty Genovese was used to basically go, look, countryside good, city's bad. And that's not what I found. Like in New York, I found that people would give you the shirt off their back and people were like, they may have been kind of brusque, but it was just such a loving like place. Like I, I mean, I walked into Barney's, the posh department store, carrying everything I, I own basically, <laughs> and and I was literally living at like I was living at Hotel Kenmore Hall. You can there, there's there's a, there's some pretty good stories about it online, but it's it was like a 34 story basically crack house. There was a, a grand old hotel where the Maltese Falcon was finished, and it was. Uh, at one point, not not while I was there, I'm not that. And uh, Nathaniel West was at once a desk clerk. Again, not when I was there, but had been bought by a crime lord and sort of run into the ground. And like it was different gangs ran different floors, and people. It was it was it was interesting. It was kind of like I knew a lot of uh, film students before I moved to Ireland. I did a um, a course in. Uh, graphic design and you know uh, i moved like fucking like i said naive i moved to new york carrying a portfolio went around all the ad agencies and they just look at you and laugh like oh you poor sack you think it's like in the movies i'm like yeah right you know Not- <laughs> yeah no um like yeah sucker um but yeah the, the the film students would always make these pretty surreal like dream sequences and it was kind of like living in one really hotel kenmore hall was very very odd but yeah, I walked into Barney's, the, the the fancy department store, and the beautiful girl behind the Chanel counter, mm-hmm. um, instead of macing me or spraying me in the eyes with whatever she had, like spray me in the eyes of Chanel number five and call security, um, just were like, are you looking for work? My brother's building a restaurant and he'll feed you. And I was like, okay. And Aww. we're still in contact. It's kind of, I'm still like, I end up, uh, I went and worked in the restaurant. Uh, and was I was eating there and worked there really until I started an art store and but yeah and I still I'm still in touch I end up living with her and her crazy chef brother for a while on Roosevelt <laughs> Island which is other weird fucking place but really pretty cool. Cool. Um, but yeah, I mean people are nice in New York. But the Kitty Jenny V story was that New York bad, countryside good, and you know um, people in the city don't care. All these people saw her being attacked multiple times and then murdered and nobody did anything and it just wasn't true i mean there's so many reasons why you know but i had a call from somebody about three in the morning and i could hear the person on the phone this woman screaming um somebody help me somebody help me please somebody help me and she was like well i feel like i should call the cops but based on my own experiences i don't want her to be in even worse circumstances you know i mean in 2017 I think it was a cop uh, came back and raped a sex worker he'd arrested earlier. Um, The ombudsman investigated and decided it was consensual that somewhere along the way they fell in love, completely ignoring the power dynamic. Um, So it's kind of, it's not good. I mean, there's another story shortly after that, Dara Quigley, this really amazing person. Uh, The mental health uh, help really doesn't exist. there, it just doesn't exist in Ireland. The conversation's really far behind. And um, it's just, I mean, I've met so many people over there that were suicidal and told to come back. I've got them beat because I'm, I'm going on four plus years, but they were told to come back um, like a year later and whatnot, you know, and uh, you can call the suicide line, which is staffed by volunteers, you know, and, it's 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 not good but this uh 
pretty amazing uh, person, Dara Quigley, had a, a bad spell and ended up um, walking naked and uh, through, through the town. Um, and uh, But a cop got the footage and shared it amongst his WhatsApp friends. And by the time she found out about it, it had been shared 230,000 times. So she took her own life. Oh and that God. cop, zero repercussions, you know? Um, but that's that's the thing. It's a it's a really misogynistic culture. Yes, it is. But so she didn't want to. Um, this person who called with a woman screaming in the background while we we're on the phone it was resolved. Uh, somebody came down and let the woman in. Um, but I, I mentioned that to the cops. You know, I was like, I want people to be able to reach out if they're in help. Like I talked to somebody here in Huddersfield that does sex work, and they were like, um. They wouldn't hesitate to call the police if they needed. But in my own research with sex workers in Ireland, um, sex workers told me that they, I mean, whether they would or not, they told me they'd take their own life before they'd call the police. I mean, I spoke to one worker on outreach and another worker who'd been, uh, both of them had been uh, raped and were afraid to call police for making, for fear of making it worse. So, um but the cops were completely confused as to why Declan Daly and Andrew Lambs are completely confused as to why people wouldn't trust them. And I was like, well, you might evict them. And they were like, well, we have to evict them <laughs> for trafficking. <laughs> it's like, but, you know, and um, he said, as a matter of fact, we've got funding to hire, bring in another 75 guardie to increase evictions against uh, sex workers. So, you know, yeah, it's, it's grim. Uh, when I mentioned that I'd been looking at emails by undocu like undocumented workers who are basically trying to explain to Irish clients, you know, bear in mind, sex ads written by fucking bishops, why you need condoms. Um, they, um, basically, the, the Irish guys aren't getting it. Like, in, in my case, like, I can go get tested whenever I'm, I'm queer. You know, I can have condoms here. These guys, if you're bullying an undocumented worker into unprotected sex, which, with a reduced uh, number of clients, like, under client criminalization, a lot of people, a lot of workers have lost their best clients, and they're a little more desperate. They're agreeing to... And the thing is, there was research out that said this before the law came in. And it's come to pass that basically workers are agreeing to things they wouldn't have done before because they're, you know, they're desperate. Wow. And so if you're the kind of guy who's bullying an undocumented worker you've never met into unprotected sex, chances are you're not going home and telling your girlfriend and going, we better wrap it up for a while. I just bullied someone into unprotected sex. So she doesn't know. And, you know, and our HIV rates are sk skyrocketing and, you know, accompanied by, you know, chlamydia, syphilis and everything else. It's just, it's, but, you know, as long as the non-NGOs are getting funding, I suppose. Um, but, yeah, what was the other thing? Um, I talked to them about trafficking, and the head of trafficking said, we haven't gotten one tip since client criminalization came in. I'm like, well, yeah, because workers won't call you and um, clients won't call you. So, so yeah, it's a shit fast. But, you know, the law's under review right now. It was a really weird, disturbing meeting. Very yeah. strange. No. Sounds like it. Um, it's really interesting for me hearing about this just from different cultural perspectives. I used to work with an organization that helped run a safe space for sex workers once a week. It was pretty much just so like, come, we'll give you a meal. It'll be a space to hang out, socialize, and just That's be cool. around other people. Yeah, it was really, really great. Um, so that got me a little bit involved in that side of activism. And then I ended up volunteering there sometimes a really cool place and really cool people so what would you like to see in an ideal world in terms of sex worker supports come out and what would be ideal legally just to see i mean obviously sex work not being a criminal thing and clients not necessarily being criminalized decrim um decrim would be great um like in New Zealand, they have a form of decrim. Uh, it doesn't benefit undocumented workers who can't avail of it. Um, but New South Wales, uh, but it, it you know it, it's better, um, better relationship with the police. I mean, yay, uh, ACAB abolished the police. However, 
um, while while they're with us. Um, but also too, there's a lot of things. I mean, there's a lot of things. I mean, Ireland has the high as the worst housing crisis in its history right now. And we got more empty houses than we do homeless families. But we got a, a government who, like, there was an affordable housing act recently, and the government that our second in command, Leo Bradker, is out sending pictures of himself having a coffee and uh, making some joke about the football. And the, our ministers, instead of showing up to vote on it, were out dancing around. Uh, to advertise for an election coming up and just they're just rich people you know and so like i mean my one of my kids that's moving over here they're currently sharing during covid sharing a toilet with 17 people you know it's bad and the government's the new housing that they're building they're building a communal housing where families will live together and like we've done that it's called a fucking tenement <laughs> like you know, and so that's what we're building. We're building new tenements. It's communal housing for multiple families. Like that's so, that's soil and green. We're kind of like, oh, we're getting there. Which I think wasn't soil and green that date really recently. Then we just, um, but yeah, it's uh, it's. I mean, it's just really wild. It was the highest. I won't say the highest uh, homeless population we we've, we've ever had because of course we had the famine where everybody was driven off for the land and you know starved with when the potato crops failed. Um, but still, it's bad. And the government could provide affordable housing and uh, that would address sex workers. Free college would be good. I mean, when I went back to school, like the area I'm from, it's, it's like 7% of the people there go to college, whereas 90% from the rich areas. And when I was in college, a lot of people, I mean, it was a great teacher-student ratio because a lot of people just didn't fucking show. So it'd be like, you know, I got to know a lot of my teachers really, really well. And they're the people I, you know, um, that I stay in contact with. Um, but sometimes it'd be me and a couple of other people. We had a lot, like 60 empty seats that there's no reason we couldn't fill those seats with the, yeah. I mean, instead of paying for, when I did outreach, there's two cops. Like there's twice as many cops, I'd say, as, than there, as there were sex workers. So you could take that money and just pay admin for some fucking sex workers yeah. to go to school. Child care. I mean, Ireland banned condoms up until the 90s. Um, and the thing is, like, now you can get contraception and now you can get abortion. But the Irish people evolved on in a way to, that they could work without it, you know? And you got babies raising babies. And, you know, so it's going to take a while before people kind of get in the swing of... You, I mean, also, there's no sex ed. There's still no comprehensive... There's no sex, comprehensive sex ed, so... You know, there's still a lot of babies raising babies, raising babies, raising babies. And you get that from multiple generations. And as a result, we've kind of got gangs of children roving the streets and they're, you know, um, they're, they're kind of dangerous, like little kind of kid. We, Lee and I got surrounded by a gang of little girls. They couldn't be more than eight. And they were yelling at us and threatening us. And I was just pushing through. And Leah's just going, she's from Texas. And she's like, what are they saying? What are they saying? What are they saying? And I was like, ah. <laughs> and I pushed her through. And we're like, yeah. what are they saying? They said they're going to kick the geese off us. And uh, she's like, uh, what's that mean? They're going to kick off our vaginas. So she's like, wait, what? <laughs> I was like, yeah, that's what they said. <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but, but, yeah, but they will. You know, they're, they're, there's, a, like, there's a little... Just roving gangs of kind of unsupervised children. I mean, I guess I was an unsupervised child myself. It's weird kind of looking back because my parents really couldn't stand me. And then it's only recently it dawned on me. They only saw me about 10 minutes a day. God damn it. <laughs> really? Like, you know, they barely saw us. We're like latchkey kids. I mean, yeah. you know, um, I mean, so was the entirety of Generation X. But, um, but yeah, it's a, it's a mess. So I don't know. That it's it's under review right now. The law. We'll we'll see. Um, I don't have high hopes. I mean, you know, it's a. Uh, I mean, but you know, what can you do though? Upwards, onwards. Yeah, you're well. You're doing it. Everything you're doing. I'm trying. <laughs> I'm trying. You know, there's a lot of learned helplessness. There's a lot of repression. Like, I think I feel like in in America we could kind of get together like 30 sex workers no problem and you know and hang out and do stuff and in ireland there's just a lot more oppression it's harder to get people together there's a lot more 
shame and secrecy and you know and that needs to go but there are there's more and more brave people standing up it is changing but good god it's slow oh, you know yeah but but yeah it's uh i don't know those things i mean free free child care um free college um i mean that's such a you know school is, is such a class weapon really it is yeah uh, yeah so um affordable housing, all of those things, let people in direct provision work, uh, bigger ways to make, uh, address trans discrimination, you know, uh, employment discrimination. I mean, that's the thing in Ireland, the laws are such that they can't fire you for being trans, but also oh, they won't hire you if you're fucking trans. So, you know, so all you can do is sex work, in case you being evicted and da, 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 da. So it's a whole thing. Yeah. Yes. But, and know. this problem leads to this other problem, and this problem leads to this other problem. And exactly. there's so much like that. Jeff Bezos going to space for four minutes for like five point five billion dollars. Like we, I can't. We could change the world with that money. It's just so infuriating. <laughs> I will I still take solace in for four minutes. There was one less terrible man on this earth. <laughs> I, I, I saw this. Someone, I think it was on Twitter. Someone was like, when Jeff Bezos gets back, let's all pretend we don't know who he is. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm down. Yeah, that would be that would be very upsetting for people like that eh? when they're all ego and then people like, I don't really give a shit. Who's this guy? <laughs> yeah, I could go on forever about yeah. people like that. There's been times when I've had uh, oil paints and everything set up and easels. And these days it's sort of while watching Netflix, it's whatever I got. So I just <laughs> have, like um, try not to topple over piles of books. So like little little squares like my Reggie Christie and little and so you know. yeah you're um, so talented it's nuts let's see baby more me. Mm. other baby me oh yeah more baby me oh uh, that one's me yeah they're so all, cool. aren't they so cool yeah yeah just so you're so talented it's crazy <laughs> and, no, i'm doing hair well oh, right really, yeah she did leah's hair like <clears throat> like blonde like a would you say like a ble- kind of like this blonde here and it's beautiful like i would have just yeah i do i would just fuck that up for sure i guess you so, lyric does uh, uh, hair a lot yeah with their hair a lot oh yeah so- yeah, it was. Yeah, I'm. Not, I've never done. I had a friend in Bastrop who's really, really amazing. She's maybe Sailor on 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 Instagram, oh, and she's just this fucking magical person. Um, S A Y L O R, but she would do. I would tattoo her, and she just uh, do my hair instead, and like I do whatever the fuck she wanted. It'd be like cotton candy pink and all. Fun. And I've heard all the horror stories about people doing their own, and honestly, like. I just stopped looking in mirrors at a certain point. So my hair is just kind of whatever. Now it's kind of dyed its own at this point. Like um, she dyed my hair for so long that when the color washed out, I'm like, what the fuck? It's, I missed, I missed the whole part when I went gray. Like, um, but, but yeah, so I was really nervous, but I really thought she's going to look like a Charlie, Charlie Brown. And I did this and I could just just making the like, well, you know, hats are cool and it's like <laughs> just shave shave shaved heads, shaved heads for a little I while. <laughs> wear a wig right now, you know. <laughs> well, man, my last haircut, I accidentally used a bit of the clipper attachment that made it too short in an area I didn't mean to, so I just ended up with a line undercut. <laughs> I was like, screw it, this is the coolest part of my hair now. <laughs> Fine. Because when my friend and I were in Vienna, we were pretty we got drunk and we this random guy just cut her bangs for her and they were like so short like straight <laughs> like that like uneven and she's like it's gonna grow back and the next morning she woke up and was just horrified so we had another month left like in europe <laughs> so funny that's a good story though i like it, it. i mean I, I, i'm down for random tattoos and random haircuts i've never heard of random haircuts yeah, totally. yeah. <laughs> i'm not getting one i'll get some rando tattoos um oh yeah me too i randomly dye my hair if someone has hair dye around and i kind of want to dye my hair that happened at a dance weekend once someone was <laughs> dyeing their hair pink for funsies outside and was like do you want some and i was like yeah, this bit of my hair is faded enough. Just like put a stripe in, it's fine. Yeah, go for it. Yeah. Our kiddos came over during COVID um, with uh, 
they had a, I think it was like a fucking dog grooming trimmers <laughs> that with one attachment. And that, because I, I cut their hair all the time as babies and I'll go to the barbers, but there was no hairdressers open or anything. And, and they have the most, Lee and I have this fucking, like you can't even see one strand under a microscope. It's just, it's invisible. <laughs> it's just it's so fucking fine. That's and they have this beautiful, thick, luscious hair that I'm really jealous of. And, you know, and well, I've been cutting their hair since they were babies. And not, I'm not that I'm good at it. I just have been cutting their hair since I was, they were babies. <laughs> but they came over and the fucking thing was battery operated and it died in the process. And, yeah. and I'm like, <laughs> or just you can't let your baby out of the world and all I had was just a fucking like you know I'm just like <laughs> trying to do their like you know like just <laughs> doesn't make it worse uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah no I mean it came out fine <laughs> but yeah they were they're fine and it goes but I, I'll show you a picture but, oh, I love a picture uh, <laughs> I want to cut my hair now after all this hair coming. I off. know. I want more. I want a tattoo. I need money. <laughs> yeah, same. I know. I need another tattoo. They they showed up in matching outfits without even meaning to. That's oh, so okay. cute. <laughs> you have gorgeous hair. Ooh, if you're up for a part two, then that'll be amazing. Because it's just crazy how many more things we have to talk. She like you have a psych degree, like we were saying, the black belt. Like I mean, I just I can't get over how many things we have to talk about. So thank you for doing this, and I will love you forever. I love both of you forever. Love all of you forever. <laughs> thank you so much. It was so nice to meet you guys. Yay! Yeah, it was great, great to meet you. Oh, that was perfect. Okay, well, let's talk again soon and just totally in awe of you and mwah, so much thank love. Thank you. Thanks for your knowledge and your stories. That was yeah. wonderful. Yeah, thank you're you so fine. much. Yeah, you're amazing. Bye.